Good day, everyone. Uh, we just wanted to let you know we're we're live. Uh, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes here till everybody logs on, and then we'll we'll get started. So, for those of you who I can see have uh, logged on already, we appreciate you being on time. We'll just wait uh, a minute or so for uh, some stragglers, and then we'll get started. All right, I think we will get started. We're uh, a minute or so after the top of the hour. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is David Failing. I'm the um, Business Development uh, Director for Lucas Diesel Systems. And on behalf of Lucas Diesel Systems, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, third webinar of 2024. Uh, for those of you who are, this is your first time, this is a monthly series and uh, we sponsor this one, and Tony Salas does a wonderful job of uh, educating us on a variety of different uh, subjects. Um, if you have any feedback with regards to these webinars, we sure would like to hear from you. Um, some housekeeping items, first and foremost, for those of you who are live on this webinar, at the end of the webinar, you will receive a uh, certificate for uh, participation in this webinar. We've also uh, muted everyone, so we try and avoid any distractions. However, if you have any questions or comments, uh, right at the bottom of your screen, or sometimes it's at the top of the screen, you can put that in the Q&A, and uh, we will try and get to as many of the questions at the end of the, the webinar as possible. Um, I'd like to just uh, go over a couple of items here. We have a, a couple of uh, promotional items that we'd like to go over for, for Lucas Diesel Systems. Uh, first of all, for, for March, we're offering a 10% discount on Reman C7 CAT injectors. You can see the listing there of the various different um, uh, part numbers. Uh, and if you cannot remember those at the end of the webinar, we will be posting this webinar on our uh, YouTube uh, page. So just look for the Lucas Diesel Systems uh, web uh, YouTube uh, page, uh, and you will be able to see all of this information. In addition to Reman C7 CAT injectors, we also have a 10% uh, discount on Series 60 turbochargers. These are uh, new turbochargers, uh, and uh, they're what we call coreless. In other words, we do not charge you a core, and we do not uh, want the core back either. So uh, we're off also offering a 12-month warranty on these uh, turbochargers. So uh, if you have any questions or want to know any more information, uh, pricing, anything like that, uh, feel free to call either Erica or myself, and we can help you out. Okay, now to get started. Uh, Tony Salas, as I said just a moment ago, is our presenter. He's a veteran technician and instructor uh, for light duty diesel systems based in the uh, Las Vegas area of the US. And um, this morning, or in my time frame, it's this morning, some of you are this afternoon already. Uh, Tony is going to present light duty truck diagnostics and let's diagnose and figure it all out. So on that note, I'd like to hand it over to Tony. I will stop sharing my uh, PowerPoint and I'll let you get started with yours. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Mr. David. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. Uh, once again, we'd like to thank Lucas for sponsoring this uh, webinar for you guys. So definitely we all like to support our those that sponsor training. So therefore say thank you. And some of you guys are cheap and don't want to pay for webinars. No, I'm kidding. I had to throw that plug in. Anyways. Um, Welcome to light duty diagnostic. Let's diagnose and figure out the problem. All right. So once again, Tony Salas is back. And if you know Tony Salas, you don't cut it. You don't cut into the cut the fat out. Let's get to it. Um, as I've been traveling and as also as I've been also working at shops and also working on vehicles here, you have to understand as you're 
taking on this information, you want to get some information to help you, is that I see many technicians that are very, hadn't had any type of diesel training, and some of them have a little bit of training, and some of them have used their customers' vehicles as guinea pigs to figure out what they're doing. And then there's those that are pattern style. In other words, the pattern style says, well, this truck had this problem, this would fix it, so this will, fi will fix it. And that's not always the case. So as time has gone by now, we're in 2024, uh, we have seen, uh, you know, how do I say this? We're seeing newer trucks, but at the same time, we're way back on where we're, you know, how we're addressing the issue. And even when I read articles from publications that are sent out either on Facebook or on other media or websites from different manufacturers too as well, is the fact that, you know, it's like this guy's talking about how he did this and how he did it this way. And turns out it was something that should have been done in, in your basics. So as you know, I've been, and, and some of you are new, I have been preaching about your diagnostic strategy. And even when I go to shops and even when I do a class and then we go to the shop, I'm like, oh God, you guys didn't hear a dang word I said, did you? So so there's the young crowd and there's, there's the average, you know, experienced technician. Then there's the veteran that's stuck in his old ways and he's still trying to do what he's going to do but and then there's the good technicians too as well there are good technicians out there that i've confronted too that not confronted but i met and uh i was pretty impressed with how well they actually did training so it's it's not very often that i'm impressed and believe me i'm not trying to act like i know it all or am i cocky in any way but jesus let's fix the truck and let's fix it in a timely manner so to diagnose you know, what are the issues that you all confront or have? And again, you're welcome to make comments. I'm just going to give you a hard time if you do make a comment. No, I'm kidding. You can just go ahead and say whatever you want. But there's crank no start. There's drivability issues. There's loss of power. The fish bite effect when you're driving the vehicle and you feel all of a sudden a jolt, but it doesn't stall, but it just gives you a jolt. We've seen that since the first days of power stroke, too. I've had on 7360s and other common rails. We see the stalling issue, all of a sudden just dies and just stalls. What is the theory? What is the mindset that we have to have when addressing that? Not to mention, maybe the truck runs great, but the check engine light or mill light is on. And then there's intermittent. Intermittent is saying like, how big is a rock, right? How intermittent is intermittent? So in this case, you can have that intermittent problem that could drive you crazy. But again, you some of you have also that I've worked with, have found the problem, but then you second guess yourself because is it a costly repair and this better fix it, blah, blah, blah. I get it. So you have to make sure that that's the problem. But sometimes if this is the test and you're doing it and maybe it doesn't fix the problem, uh, please note that maybe it was a problem too that you had. So can a truck have more than one issue? The classic story I've been saying in the past has been when a truck comes in, the engine is locked up, it's grenaded, it's no good, it needs an engine rebuild or engine replacement. But you don't know how the injectors were. You don't know how the turbos were. You don't know what the particulate filter had and all this. And you have this series of codes in memory. And you don't know if it's caused to the current failure or something that the driver was just, you know, the owner of the vehicle was driving with that check engine light right on. So, you know, I don't want to go into the classic stuff that I've been talking about. But sometimes, you know, it's like I say it and I say it and I say it and I teach it, you know. So, you know, recently, you know, you look at a scan tool and everybody wants to rely on the scan tool and those instructors and those people teaching that your scan tool is your first, you know, tool to get, that is a big no-no. Let's get that clear. No, the scan tool should not be the first tool you grab. You verify the problem. You see what the problem's going on. You open the hood because a scan tool won't tell you if the battery terminals are dirty, right? We don't know what's going on. We could read a voltage, but that's something you should have seen. So as much as we're trying to repair, and I know this presentation is about figuring out and diagnosing, please note you're also a business and you got to support your business and your boss or wherever, unless you're the owner, you're also looking for legitimate work. That's why some shops like we used to do as well is we actually do a bumper to bumper inspection too as well. So we're looking for works. In other words, it was funny. It, there was a time we were doing ball joints like there was no tomorrow. And if you know the business, you understand that you don't make money on diagnostics, really. You, it's, it's, it's not a very good, the gravy stuff, in other, words, in other words, the gravy work, as we call it, the ball joints, the brake jobs, the oil changes, the services, the other intake services and stuff, because the diagnostics sometimes doesn't, rep doesn't sometimes pay. And when you're trying to sell a customer four, three, four hours of diagnostic time, that's a hard sell. And I get it. You've got to sell it. And that's where your guy who's in the front doing the phone calling and doing the salesmanship to sell legitimate work. 
So in this case, when you're doing some scanning, you know, you look at all the features that you have here, like this gel test here, you're going to notice that you all, you can actually, you know, do different stuff. But in this case, do you know what you're doing? For example, we've been talking about Ford in past, past presentations, and we mentioned about, you know, Keon Engine, Keon Engine running self-test. And when you're doing this, right, you got to understand that, you know, okay, what are we doing? What are we trying to get across with using Ford, right? So we'll get more into that. But before we start, you know, your diagnosis, sometimes it just stops with fuel, you know. We used to do, you know, my my great technician, Mitch, he used to do a sniff test on the fuel, like I mentioned before. And it was amazing how you can find out what's in the fuel, you know. Because nowadays, that fluid, you know, depending on who's driving the company vehicle, they can make the mistake of actually pouring the death fluid into diesel. So I get it. Dieselcraft.com does a great job of selling you kits to do test strips so you can actually test not only the diesel for death contamination, but also the vice versa, death that has diesel contaminated in it. So some of you, this is a, I know it's a basic one for a lot of you, you can see it, but can we wash out the death fluid out? The answer is no, it's crystallized. Once it sits there, it crystallizes. And then if we're talking about biodiesel, you know, if it's cheap quality, non-certified bio, because it's somebody's French fry blend, you know, we understand that bio can solidify it thanks to the glycerin. So in this case, let's not forget that fuel is vitally important for the performance of this diesel. And again, you got to make sure you got fuel because how many times I would say when we were really busy, I would say at least one truck a month would come in with just the issue was it just died and it just didn't have fuel. And the customer was didn't want to fix the sending unit or the fuel level sensor, right? So in this case, it's very important to understand that yeah, fuel does play a key role here. Not to mention the biggie. And this is a biggie, the engine state of health, right? What is the state of health of that engine? Where is that engine at? And with today's trucks, not even today's trucks, quite a lot of years now, we're in 2024, right? SCR came out somewhere around 2011, 2012, big time. You know, we've had particulate filters since 07. So in this case, if you're replacing particulate filters a lot, you're, you got numerous nonstop issues with SER and NOx reductions and so on. Sometimes it goes back to the state of health of the engine because especially with after treatment, you have to understand that when you look at after treatment, what is the quality of that, of that exhaust when it's going down that downpipe, right? So yeah, compression is a biggie, you know? Blow by, like we talked about in previous presentations, blow by, no, it's not okay to have excessive blow by. You know, you do the cap test where you see if it blows it. Yeah, but you're looking at your blow by gases when it's just sitting there at idle with no load. Now, what is the blow by under a load? So if this truck's pulling 15, 20,000 pounds, depending on what truck it is, what is the blow by at that point? And then are you ingesting a lot of oil, which in turn causes premature suit loading in the diesel particulate filter? So we've been also mentioning about leaks. These trucks do not pretty much allow any exhaust leaks. Actually, any truck, whether with after treatment or with after treatment, exhaust plays a key role here. So in this case, no, we do not want leaks. You know, I had a guy tell me, you know, hey, I'm smelling exhaust as I'm sitting at a stop. You know, I think I need to change my filters. Like, what filter are you talking about? And this is a technician. And in this case, no, dude, you have an exhaust leak. You either got an up pipe leak, you got something, a turbo going on, you're leaking exhaust. So no, exhaust leaks are not okay. Not to mention with today's engines or today's diagnostics and even diagnostic trouble code of testing the uh, ability of that injector to perform work, you know, we understand that the intake and the exhaust do play a major role in determining fuel injection quantity and also fuel injection timing. So in this case, that plays a key role. That's why, as I will mention later, smoke testing is a very big thing for us. It's To me, it's now a mandatory tool. And if you've been using smoke testers and you have it sitting there collecting dust, if you have one, you should be using it a lot on today's diagnostics because you're trying to smoke up that intake, smoke up that exhaust, and let's see if we have any leaks. And you'd be surprised, especially on the intake side, what you might find. So in this case, that affects also your mass airflow readings along with your map readings. So that affects your fuel calibration. Remember, you can have two identical trucks, okay? Whether it being a Duramax, a Power Stroke, whatever it is, and you can have two identical trucks, same options, same everything, and one will get better fuel economy than the other. So what's going on? Is it calibration? Is it transmission? But it, is it also the sensor readings due to leaks either on the intake side 
or on the exhaust side. So we got to keep that in mind. But again, let's not forget compression. Compression is a big deal, right? So in this case, we're supposed to have the adequate compression. Now you better be careful. If you've seen my LM2 Duramax presentation along with LZO, what has happened to compression? 250 PSI. So in this case, that specification for compression has gone down. Obviously the boost levels are through the roof on that from the factory, but in this case, the compression is not the same. So we got to do our little homework and figure out what's the compression specification for different engines. Now, back in the day, any, any of you guys that have been in this business for a long time, you understand that back in the day, a diesel engine was judged by its crankcase pressure, and many diesel engines had a crankcase pressure specification. So you still can use a manometer or some kind of water manometer to measure, again, the crankcase pressure out of that engine to know if we got excess blow by, which in turn means that compression's at a loss. So the engine also needs to breathe. You know, how many times have we, and this is again, goes back to no scan tool at the beginning because can an air filter ca cause havoc? And my God, can it cause havoc? If that air filter is never replaced, maintenance, 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 right? If it's never replaced, what's gonna happen there is that you're gonna have issues with the breathability of the engine. You're gonna run a fuel rich strategy and you're also gonna premature the DPF as well, the diesel particulate filter. Not to mention when you do a state of health of the engine and you're doing a crank speed, you know, what is the crank speed? You know, we had a 7.3, even an old dog, 7.3 power stroke. And this thing was always a hard starter. And they were telling me by phone, it's a hard start. I go, battery start? Yeah, batteries were charged. They put new batteries. Turns out the problem was the starter, right? The starter draw, in other words, internally, the commutator, the armature inside of that starter was going bad. So it was turning slow. And they didn't realize that they were adjusted to the speed. In other words, they thought that was normal speed when we found out that, no, your truck's not starting because you don't have adequate crank speed because you have a bad starter or AKA batteries or battery cables, right? And then we got exhaust restricted, right? You can have exhaust that's restricted. So the question begs, how do you know? And I've been a big advocate about teaching you guys about disconnecting the downpipe. In other words, it's just unhook that downpipe at the flange where the downpipe meets the rest of the exhaust. That's the base place to go ahead and disconnect. And I can tell you how many trucks I have repaired or diagnosed where we just disconnect that exhaust and let's go ahead and crank it. Now the engine runs. That's how restricted that engine is, right? So we got to figure out what has been damaged. And then when we talk about Cummins 5.9s, we talk about Cummins 6.7s and even Duramax, LB7, even till the day with L5P, you know, what about valve lash? You guys are not adjusting valves, and you're going to find out that valve adjustment is a biggie because that will affect fuel calibration. If there's excessive valve lash, in other words, the tick, 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 tick sound that a lot of people say, oh, that's the injector. And that's another thing, by the way, is all the BS that I hear about, you know, technicians saying, oh, it's this. And they're just giving you just something that you, it's believable, if you will. So they're trying to get away from the work. Yeah, work is business and business is money. So therefore, in this case, valve lash is a service we ought to be doing. So therefore, you need to adjust those valves. So please note, have I repaired uh, balancing rate issues on a Duramax by simply doing a valve lash adjustment? And the answer is yes. So therefore, you got to be adjusting those valves. Okay, they're, they're adjustable, like I said, on Duramax applications, Cummins applications too, and other small diesels too out there. So like I mentioned already, and I've shown this slide before, I need to update, I need to take, take a picture. And every time I do a smoke test, I forget to take a picture. But in this case, get a smoke tester if you don't have one. They're dropped in price ever since I bought mine. I paid, I paid, well, I paid okay. I think I paid like 2,400 bucks for this one. But in this case, smoke testers are the way to go now. And you know, you cannot use an EVAP style. You could, but the problem has no pressure behind it. And the beauty of this, I can take it up, what is it, 20 some pounds, 20 pounds, of pressure i can smoke up the intake so i can find those leaks you know and it's funny when you do a smoke test you might have multiple leaks that you all you got is this big cloud of smoke in the engine compartment you don't even know where the source is so that's why some of them come with a dye you're going to notice right up here that it says with ultra trace dye so the dye may help you not all times may help you locate where the leak is at so therefore definitely have to do that and if you look at ford service procedures even in the exhaust stream they want you also to do some kind of smoke testing to make sure you don't have any leaks. So very important that because you have to make sure you don't leaks. And again, guys, you're going to find out if you've never used a smoke machine, this might be an eye opener for you because again, you're going to find multiple leaks, especially around the intake, the EGR base, around the turbocharger, boots, and so on. So therefore, 
yeah, definitely it's nice to put some pressure on her to find a leak. So I think I'm going to do a webinar on the smoke testing alone, or at least half a webinar on smoke testing. So we'll try to do that live. All right, common rail. You know, as instructed before, common rail breaks down the three departments. And my God, this, I who knows how many common rail classes and Duramax and power stroke classes I've done. And my God, the strategy some of you take is not conducive for diagnostics. You've got to understand that you do not judge a high pressure system unless you have verified the low pressure lift pump pressure volume. So therefore, like my last line there on the slide says, always start with low lift pump pressure and volume. You know, that 30, uh, one liter in 30 seconds is a good rule. You know, one liter in 30 seconds is a good rule. You're looking for volume. Pressure is nice, yes, but what really makes the thing work and that we got to burn the fuel to make power is because we need that volume of fuel coming in. So in this case, yes, we're going to look at that and definitely verify that we have lift pump pressure. So don't diagnose a common rail system if you haven't verified first, is it getting fuel to the injection pump, right? So as we talk about common rail, again, low pressure, high pressure, and return. And when we look at high pressure, yes, that is what's needed for injection. But we understand that many systems still use some kind of actually some, use a pressure relief valve. If not, they're now using a volume control valve on the high, excuse me, a pressure control, sorry, pressure control valve on the high pressure side. So that has been replacing the old traditional pressure relief valve or pressure limiting valve. So, and then we got our return, okay? And you're going to find out that I'm one of those guys that does return testing, but I do it in a different way on early models. But yet on piezo, we also got to verify pressure too as well. Are we getting that return pressure? So when I teach Cummins 6.7 diagnostics on common rail, I just did a class recently for one guy. And uh, we got to understand that, yeah, we have lift pump pressure coming in. We got to make sure we got that volume. And if you've been following Cummins through the years, they're all about volume, aren't they? So in this case, you check volume of fuel coming into the filter, but after the filter, especially. So the banjo bolts, are reasonably easy to get to. And if it, there's no aftermarket accessory, yeah, that CP3 pump or CP4 is reasonable to get to. So you got to verify that. There you go. But you'll notice that we have a line going there. Let me grab my little uh, highlighter here. And what you're going to see is that we have, where are you at? There you go. You're going to see that we have our high pressure line feeding fuel over to the rail. But then again, there's that pressure relief valve, okay, on these Cummins 6.7s. And in this case, that's going to actually what? That's going to relieve excess pressure, but it should never relieve excess pressure. That would be just in case that we spike out over 27 plus thousand PSI of pressure. So in this case, it can leak and cause low rail pressure at, at high engine loads. So that's the classic P0087 low rail pressure code we get where we actually see a leakage due to, again, high leakage on under high loads. In other words, you've got serious pressures and that pressure relief valve is leaking. So that's the problem, child. But your scan tool is helpful at this point. This is where I don't dock the scan tool yet. By this point, when you're doing diagnostics, you should be using the scan tool to read your desired and actual fuel rail pressure. And those of you that are new to this, please note that's critical. When you look at a scan tool, you want to look at the desired or set point of rail rail pressure that the computer wants and the actual. And if you're, again, you're inexperienced, please note, this is constantly changing. So therefore, you do not make up a magic number what the pressure should be. You follow whatever the computer is desiring or the set point. So in this case, definitely want to pay attention to that. So now, since we're talking about Cummins right here, let's please, let's not forget, where's my, here we go. You're going to notice that there is the tube to injector mating. Time and time again, we have seen technicians not pay attention to torquing, Right. So in this case, that injector has a hold down torque and that tube also has a hold, hold down torque and an installation process. So please understand that that whole passage where the tubes meet the injectors, as you see me outlining there, that goes to that return banjo that you see there at number nine. Okay, that is your total return coming out of there. So even though that passage is a return, it's also a place where the tube meets the injector and at that point, if that's not seated correctly, we can have leak between the tube and the injector, but you won't externally see it for the simple reason that you actually have the leak in the return passage. So keep that in mind as we move along there. So there's that, there's that transfer tube. So I cannot stress that enough. 
about making sure you install it. Injector goes in, then the tube goes in and you made them together. You'll see each one fit. Then at that point, you go ahead and tie the tube, but then you torque down the injector. Then lastly, you torque down the tube. Now you're gonna find out that different vendors are gonna tell you that you're supposed to, even Bosch, who's the manufacturer of this, they're gonna tell you that every time you do the injectors, you do the tube. Why? Well, there could be wear and tear on the tip of that tube because it wasn't seated correctly, so we have to inspect it. But also, there's actually a filter in here. So inside of the tube, believe it or not, there is a screen or some type of filter. And that's what you're looking for. Okay, but you can't do nothing about it because it's all in the tube. So therefore, you replace the tube, and that's what you're going to do. So. So as we've talked about common rail, and those of you that have new, I've always started with the LB7 because it's been the first one that ever taught me to as well, is that always remember, like we said, there's the low pressure side and there's the high pressure side. So all the way from here, all the way back to the tank, that is all low pressure. Now this Duramax is another one that I come across that guys don't understand. First of all, behind the CP3 pump, and that, yes, that's a Bosch CP3 pump, you're going to find there is a transfer pump. A lot of you know this. I get it. Bear, bear with me. But you're, one of the things we got to do is measure suction, right? But you got to measure total suction. So you'll notice that we do have, where's my mouse here? Oh, I'm trying to find it. I see the light so bright on my screen. But in this case, you're going to see there's a gauge. So there's a special gauge you're going to test. So let me just jump here. From even our old worksheets, you know, one of the things we told the guys to do in our diesel master class was uh, master course was you're going to actually pump the system like GM even says it. If you go to fuel system diagnosis in the GM service procedures, it's going to tell you that you need to go ahead and measure again the total leak down because we want to know if we're leaking. But at the same time, you're going to prime the system to 10 PSI. That's why it's a vacuum pressure gauge. You're going to measure PSI and you're going to measure inches of vacuum. So what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and pump it up. That plunger or that filter primer pump on the fuel filter, you're going to housing, and you're going to pump it up to 10 PSI and watch the rate of decay to tell you if you got a leak at the cascade valve, right? But then what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and do a total suction test, which I believe I put here. And step number seven is saying restrict the line between the fuel filter assembly and the high pressure pump, usually we get some crimp pliers on the outlet line, which goes to the, which is the top line on the fuel filter housing on most LB7s through LMMs. And what you're going to do, you're going to go ahead and pinch it and you're going to crank the engine. Over. But you got to disable the vehicle. On the old LB7s, what did we do? We just disconnected the uh, ICMB relay, or you can take out the FICM relay, or you can just leave the key off and manually crank it with the relay. Uh, you can have a relay tester with the switch on it and just crank it with the key off and you could do a total suction test. So in this case, yeah, you were doing a total suction. How well does that CP3 pump suck the fuel? And we should see at least 15 inches of vacuum. And the problem is a lot of guys don't do this test. So they're trying, they're, they're replacing the fuel filter. They think they got a bad filter housing. No, the problem is, you're just not drawing enough you know, suction there to actually pull it in. So in this case, let's go ahead and erase here. So therefore, again, you're checking that low pressure side for a total suction test. So again, you're gonna pinch the line on the outlet of the filter and you're gonna go ahead and crank it over and do a total suction test and you should see 15 inches. If you don't see 15 inches, guys, then most likely your problem is that transfer pump on the back of that CP3, AKA means that we have to replace that CP3. So can't stress that enough. But then when the engine is running, you know, we're actually having to look at total inches of suction that we're getting. And normally we should see under four inches or under. That's what we're supposed to see on drivability. Again, don't look at the high pressure side if you haven't confirmed. You could have two issues, by the way. You can have a problem in your suction, losing prime, and you could have a leak on the high side. I get it. But in this case, you got to verify one and the other because I would hate you to replace injectors. Oh yeah, I got to replace the injectors and the engines don't, still don't start, right? Because you haven't checked total suction. And that applies to anything out there. You need to have low pressure fuel. So the Duramax applications are all suction all the way up to LML. But on the L5P, they put a lift pump, which we'll show you here. But what I'm trying to get across is you got to master that gauge. So these numbers should be something you should be looking at. So once again, what am I going to do? Okay, I got a crank no start. I got to do a total suction. I hook up the gauge. 
I pinch the line on the outlet of the filter going towards the injection pump. And what I do is I crank it over. You crank it over, you should get how many inches? 15 inches. You know, you're supposed to see 15 inches, right? And then if the engine does run and you got a drivability problem, you should be four or less. If you're at five, the rule says you replace the fuel filter. Okay. And if it's higher than that, right, that means you probably got something going on in the tank and the fuel filter too. And remember something, if a fuel filter is really loaded, you better tell that customer to come back in a week or so and let's check the suction again. Because if, the, if it goes up again, that means that filter is getting filled with junk again, which questions now that we need to pull the tank down and we're going to have to go ahead and clean out the tank because there's junk in the tank that's actually contaminating that fuel filter too soon. Make sense? So now on the high pressure side, you know, when we take this information, we apply it to other common rails is the pressure, uh, excuse me, the pressure relief valve, right? Or pressure limiting valve. Yes. The, the LB sevens had a junction block right there. And that was only used on LB sevens. while the LLI, well, out wise, where did they put it? They put it on the back of the rail on the driver's side. There was a pressure relief valve. So that could actually be leaking and lose rail pressure. So those of you that are new or novices at this, what is the classic novice mistake with common rail, any common rail? And that is, okay, truck comes in, not enough rail pressure. I check lift pump pressure, like Tony said. Well, it's not generating any pressure, so there's got to be a bad pump. No. In order to build pressure, you got to push against something. So who could be the leak point here? Well, it could be the injector, too. So any injector, whether being piezo, whether being... Siemens, whether it be Bosch, whether it be Denso, if they have excess return, guess what's going to happen? You're going to leak it back to the return. So your return flow rate will be very high. So there you go. Okay. So therefore, inside of the pump, please note, we told you another test. As a matter of fact, let me come back. I don't want to lose you. We talked about priming the system to 10 PSI, right? Here we go. 10 PSI right there. So in this case, we're going to jack it up to 10 PSI. Why did we do that? Because you're watching the rate of decay because that fuel that's being fed into a CP3 pump also is got to have some management valve that controls the lube fuel. So we also have fuel inside of that and pump that's actually lubricating the pump, right? So in this case, and cooling down the pump too, but there's got to be a cascade valve. Now they don't show it in this diagram. I, I've never have been able to find one that shows a cascade valve clearly, but the cascade valve is controlling that pressure. So in this case, that could be leaking to return, okay? So therefore you can have a leaky cascade of LP as we've seen many cases where you don't got enough rail pressure and they've done the injectors, they've done the pressure relief valve, but it still doesn't fix the truck. Well, it turns out they got excess return. Now Bosch from Bosch Systems offers a return spec, which is while the engine's running, it is one liter in one minute. I actually remember that, I can't believe it. But the way you can do it from GM is they're telling you to prime that filter, you know, watch the gauge, prime that low pressure to 10 PSI and watch the rate of decay. If it dumps slowly, that real quickly dumps fast within 10, 15 seconds, then you definitely have a leaky cascade valve, which you have going on right there. And there's your cascade valve. Okay. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this, I know some of you know this, but a lot of you don't know this. So in this case, uh, please note that can be leaking. Okay, so what about a Cummins 5.9 or 6.7 that has a CP3 pump? Does it have a cascade valve? Yes, it does. So in this case, that cascade valve, how am I going to diagnose this? There's nothing to prime, right? So in this case, the way you test it on those is you measure the return off of the, the injection pump. So there's a return line coming out. There's a nipple with a hose. You disconnect it, and you go ahead and adapt your hose into a container, and you measure that return flow rate for one minute, right? So therefore, if it's returning too much, that means that cascade valve is leaking. So therefore, it's releasing too much, which in turn will not allow you to build enough rail pressure. So remember that. There you go. So if you don't remember that, well, we can have a problem. So there you go. So when we look at various different applications, I have, I have a slide here for the CP3s once again and other applications too. You're going to notice right here that the MPROP, AKA known as a fuel rail pressure regulator or the volume control valve it has many names, same components, the guy that's on the injection pump, right? And in this case, this guy is controlling the volume of fuel going to the plunger. So if I were to ask you, hey, how do most common rail systems control the fuel rail pressure? 
Well, they control the volume of fuel going to the plunger. So yeah, as we go back to this old CP3 slide right here, there you can see the three plungers, but we got to feed fuel to these guys. And who's feeding the fuel? That's actually this guy right here, which you can see, well, actually I actually have it off right here. It goes right here. It's not in the picture, but it's the FRPR, aka known as the MPROP, aka known as the volume control valve, right? And this guy is computer controlled. So therefore it is pulse width modulated so when it's fully open, it's de-energized. When it's fully closed, it's energized. So therefore, when the computer applies a pulse width going to it, it's going to actually control the lifting up and down. And so what's it doing in real, like the slide shows right here? It's controlling fuel from the supply pump or your lift pump or your suction pump going to the high pressure plungers. And within that is same injection pump. So it's a volume control. That's why I like the name volume control. It's controlling the volume of fuel. So it's opening, closing, opening, closing to control that. Right. So therefore, we can look at that there, too. Now, some of you may know the trick already, but I'll, I'll say it anyways. In the event you have a high return, let's say an injector is leaking or you got to leak at that pressure limiting valve I talked about. You're going to see the duty cycle for the FRPR or MPROP or VCV higher than 32 percent. So if you're at 36, 38, 40 percent, that means we're changing. We may have a leak, but in reality, it's less. I said that wrong. Because if it's at 32% normally, while the engine is running, and you see that, and you understand that in order to get it to flow more fuel, that means it's going to de-energize it more. So that means the duty cycle drops. So in this case, if I see, let's say, 15, you know, 1.5% of duty cycle when I'm supposed to be at 30 at idle, that's telling me I'm flowing a lot of fuel past that fuel pressure regulator here or that improv because of the fact that I got a high return. So a quick check you can do on either Cummins applications with Bosch Common Rail and other applications, even on a 6.4, I can look at the VCV duty cycle and I could tell you that if I see a high number, that means I'm flowing what? I am flowing too much fuel, which is telling me I got a high return, AKA injectors could be the problem or it could be the fuel limiting valve too as well. So. so Again, we got to know what we're dealing with. So those of you guys that are amateur, when you're trying to figure out the problem with a common rail system, you got to understand that, hey, I need fuel, but that fuel rail pressure should meet those guidelines, desired versus actual. If it's low, but the, wait, hold on. When are you taking that pressure reading though? Are you doing it at idle? Are you doing it while you're driving down the road? Are you doing it when you're loaded? You're doing it at all times. That's why I like the scan tool that can display a graph. Because I got a test drive. I don't have somebody with me. I can just watch the graphs and I can see if they're both even. Here's my desired. Here's my actual. Are they both the same? Even though the number doesn't matter to me, all I care is, is it meeting the desired number? I'm, the computer's the main man here, so I'm going to let him decide. So in this case, if it's desiring 22,000 under a load, I should see what? 22,000 is my actual. So therefore, those follow each other, and that's what you're doing. There. So, so again... Low side first, check your volume. Go ahead and check your high pressure, but make sure you don't have a leak at the pressure relief valve. And, and in case I didn't say this earlier, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Um, when you are testing that pressure relief valve on those Cummins applications, those earlier ones, all you do is take the banjo bolt off, right? And if it's moist on this side, not, obviously it's going to be moist on the on the line side, but if it's moist on the rail side, that means that you are leaking. There should be no fuel wetness at all on it. If there is, that means you are leaking. So so what do you do? Well, I'm at the opinion now, and I've been at the opinion for now, that I just buy the aftermarket plugs, believe it or not. This may get me in trouble. No, it doesn't, because it, the system is there to protect over pressurization. We plug them for performance purposes, but we also plug them for the fact that they're a nuisance. They can cause havoc. It's a place where trash collects. So therefore, please understand that it, the computer, if it sees an error or it cannot read the fuel rail pressure sensor, it shuts down fuel rail pressure anyway. So I guess it's a redundant protection. Leave it there if it makes you happy. But like I said, I like to plug them now. Now, for those of you that have been around Cummins for a long time, you probably know this. But what are the high failing cylinders on a Cummins application, especially the five nines? But we see it on the six sevens. It's actually number five and number six. So therefore, these last two cylinders are usually the problem. Why are they usually the problem? Because when fuel comes in from the injection pumps and there's trash in there because of poor maintenance and filtration, where does all the trash go? It goes to the back of the rail. So who are the two in the back? 
usually number five and six. So what happens is that that trash can hang up a nozzle and in turn that can overfill the cylinder and overfilling the cylinder can cause catastrophic destruction, especially a number six, sometimes number five. But in this case, we see that because of injection being injecting too much fuel because of trash hanging up on there. So, and I've said before about the contamination factor, right? Anyways, so as you look at a par stroke six, seven, here's an earlier model. This is a 2011 to 2013 model. We can see that, you know, we need to understand the return system on a piezo common rail. And when we look at a, again, a common rail for these power stroke six, seven, please note that it technically has two returns. You're gonna find out that the return from the injectors, you're gonna see them all right here. And you're gonna notice this line, it's a plastic uh, rubber line, and it'll actually go to the inlet of the secondary filter. So in this case, we also see another line right here for the driver's side injectors and it unites at a T and again, it goes to the in other words, what you're going to understand here, and for those of you new, you're going to be lost on this. So take a power stroke six, seven presentation so you can understand this better. But for now, please note that the return is the pressure is the same as lift pump pressure. Because that where I scribble right here, this is the inlet of the secondary filter. This is the outlet going out towards the injection pump. So therefore, that's the inlet. So that would mean that lift pump pressure and return pressure on these systems for the returns of the injectors is actually the same. Yes, so it is the same. So therefore, the newer design power strokes actually have how many nipples though? They have a third one, which goes, they have now a dedicated return nipple going there from the injector. So, but the older ones, as you can see here, has the return going straight to the line for the inlet of that secondary filter, which you see there. So therefore, that's what you're going to see there. So. So in this case, you're going to need to buy the adapters. Let's say I need to do a return test. Let's choose this back injector. There are adapters that plugs off the actual injector line, and you could see the fuel coming out of that injector measure of volume test. So please note, there are adapters shown, shown, sold in the after world at after, after, aftermarket parts that is showing you how to do a return test off of each injector, which I have done from time to time when I'm trying to make sure I have do do have a bad injector there. So some of you know about the compression test. I talked about this before on previous webinars where we're now finding that these injectors, especially on severe duty trucks like the F650s, 750s that do a lot of uh, PTO running time or a lot of low speed, hard running chugging time like a dump truck is that we're finding that they're eating away at the nozzle. So therefore we're seeing compression coming back up through the injector. So one of the things we do is we take the lines all off and we crank the engine over and see if we got compression leaking out of an injector. So that's under severe duty. We're seeing that there. So there you go. So understand the common rail that we have on each system. And in this case, we notice that on the backs of that driver's side rail, there's your volume control valve right there. So again, no pressure limiting valve on this. See, this is newer. So in this case, the volume control valve is now controlling the volume of fuel coming out. So there's a nipple right here, and this is your other return right here. So that joins with the return from the injection pump. So that's, like I said, there's two returns. This is return right here. So these two from the volume control valve and the injection pump, and that's what goes back to the fuel tank. Well, the returns from the injectors goes back to where? To the secondary fuel filter. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what we're talking about. Again, feel free to ask questions. If you have any questions, I'll just, uh, you know, pick up on you know, anything. Else. Gee, not one hello or nothing. What the heck, man? All right, fine. I stand alone in this. Let's talk about L5P. Now, for those of you who haven't had an L5P class, the L5P is the 2017 and newer GMC Chevrolet Sierra trucks and the big trucks too as well. Um, but in this case, what is so different about the L5P versus the previous Duramax 6.6 .6 liter models? is the fact that look at number six. Obviously, I'm not doing an L5P class, but number six is your indirect injector. So that indirect injector is not the same as the common rail injector. So therefore, what you're going to see there is that that is what injects fuel into the exhaust. So those of you who haven't had any training on this, please note, yes, we're injecting fuel in the exhaust for cleaning the DPF. That's another class too. But what's so different between an LML and a L5P is that that injector is used on an LML, which is a 2011 to 2016 truck, okay? And what's gonna that tell you 
is that the LML is using return fuel off of the injection pump. This is using lift pump pressure. So if I start at number 14, there's my primary tank right there. Let me get my highlighter here. Tony, where are you? There you go. There's my pump right there, and there it goes up to the filter. There's your fuel filter. And that's a frustrating part about L5Ps is they're only using one fuel filter while everybody else is using a primary and a secondary, you know, so therefore you're seeing that. But anyways, as we leave the fuel filter, which is next to the spare tire almost, or either front and back of the of the of the differential you're going to see that that goes straight to the injection pump but prior to injection pump it goes to number six which is the lift pump so therefore there we could see that we have lift pump pressure and volume coming from the lift pump that feeds the injection pump which in turn feeds the high pressure side and provides us the high real pressure so now if you've been aware about alpha ip believe it or not we're still seeing issues with the connectors going to the pressure sensors on the rail. So number seven, that's the pressure sensor. There's still issues with those connectors because GM, I'm sorry, GM, I've always loved GM, but you've been cheap on connectors. And if you look at CAN issues, you see communication issues, you got sensor issues. A lot of it is what the connectors that they're using. The old style weather pack connectors are a thing of the past, you know? So therefore definitely got to do connector inspections when it comes to this whole common rail system, you know, definitely have to do that. So or else we're going to have intermittent issues and crazy issues. So there you go. All right. So in this case, uh, know the system, how it operates. And in this case, this system's still traditional. You're going to see that every injector has a return, and there's a return coming from each side on this Denso common rail. And there's your return coming off the vol their version of a volume control valve, which is what GM calls the FRPR2. And that's what we see going on there. So... But again, all that return all goes back to the, as you can follow these lines, it all goes back to the tank. So we have to know how it all works. Definitely want to pay attention to that. So, all right, makes sense? Because we have to have, again, the correct, you know, we have to have the correct understanding of how we transfer. And guys, I know some of you are been to my all my webinars. I know you're doing great. But I'm addressing those guys that haven't had training with common rail and understanding each system it is. So therefore, we got to have a logic on how we a diagnosis. So if I got this L5P, I'm not going to cut to the. I'm not going to start going crazy on it. I know it has a three phase pump, and it's that's another knowledge. How are we going to diagnose it? But what I'm trying to say is, hey, wouldn't it be a good idea? Let's just do a volume test. Am I getting volume of fuel going to that injection pump? right? One liter in 30 seconds should suffice. And I could use that number across the board. You know, I did a diagnostics with a technician and it was a Ford, uh, what was it? An F55650 with a 5.9 Cummins motor in it. So it's a Ford with a Cummins motor, an old, old dog. And it had the common rail 5.9 on it. And I said, we're going to diagnose this truck without a scan tool. And what we did was, okay, do we have lift pump pressure and volume, right? So we, we go ahead and we go to the injection pump. We disconnect the line, which is the supply from the lip pump. I don't know where the lip pump has got the saddle tanks on it. And sure enough, I got hardly any fuel coming into that injection pump. And this is a crank no start. So I said, well, we got no, we got no lip pump pressure volume. So therefore we got to find it. And turns out that lip pump was located behind the computer on the driver's side of the engine. If you know those five, nine red motors, right? The Cummins motors. And sure enough, there was power going to the, you could see electric, there's two wires coming out of the pump. They're it had power and ground. We're good. We did a voltage drop test across it, and it was a bad pump. Put a pump in it, primed it a few times, boom, fired right up, and we never used the scan. So because to me, when you diagnose any kind of drivability issue and you're at, you're at the fuel rail pressure, maybe you did scan and you do see a rail pressure code, you should always verify your lift pump pressure and volume, right, and any counter. So always have to check that. So, all right. So definitely want to make sure that we we understand that. So again, very important to know. So there you go. All right, thanks for the comments. I'll get to some of you more later. I've only read a handful of them, but this case, see, I like getting comments. It tells me that you're there. You're, you're awake there. Hello. All right. Um, so the next issue is gauges, right? In this case is gauges. Like here you can see we're doing a lift pump pressure test on a, a par stroke 6.4. And in this case, the spec is, uh, what was it, 4 to 6 PSI? So in this case, 4 to 6 PSI, somewhere around there. So we had very low. But you know what the problem was on this one? That's why I always kept this picture. is because, And we fixed a lot of 6.4s that way. Because 
The 6-4 is one of the few common rail systems that I know of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I know this on a 6-4 belt, that actually has a fuel pressure regulator for the lift pump side. So inside of the secondary filter housing, which is behind right here, you're going to see that, actually, it's that guy right there. You're going to see that, you're going to find out that, I'm getting myself ahead of myself. You're going to find out that inside of that housing, in that tube, is the regulator. So in this case, we see a regulator there, and that regulator has to be replaced. So in this case, that's what fixes, because we had good volume coming out of the pump, but the pressure wasn't correct. So, and it was causing drivability problems. Turns out we had a hung up regulator. So please note, if you ever done a 6.4 and you replace the pump, yet your pressure is still low and you're scratching your head, uh, please remember, even in the Ford coffee table books, it'll show that there is a fuel pressure regulator inside of that filter housing. So what's the fix? You got to buy the whole housing, literally got to buy the whole housing. So therefore you can't just buy the regulator itself. So please note. All right, cool. All right, we're staying awake. Again, any questions, please feel free. We're moving along pretty good here. Now, what about using your diagnostic trouble codes? Yes, use diagnostic trouble codes. I don't have a problem with that, but again, a code can only do so much for you, but if we look at this, we're going to notice that the ECM monitors the operation of fuel rail pressure sensor circuit and stored fault codes related to the following conditions. Fuel rail pressure sensor high, fuel rail pressure sensor low, fuel rail pressure too low, fuel rail pressure too high, fuel rail pressure sensor circuit performance, or fuel delivery. So in this case, when we look at this, you got to understand what you're looking at. Do you have a circuit issue, electrical issue? Or do you have a pressure issue, right? So if it says pressure too low, pressure too high, yeah, we got a pressure issue. But if we have a sensor circuit high, that means you are open or you're shorted to ground on the circuit itself. Or even, I love this one right here, is fuel pressure sensor circuit performance. So you got to understand what you're reading when you get a diagnostic trouble code, right? Well, it says fuel pressure sensor high. You're going to think high rail pressure. Uh -uh sensor circuit high, which means you got an open or an intermittent open, because maybe it's reading correctly right now when it's in front of you. It could be you have a circuit issue. So that's where we start wiggling and jiggling, and we could have a pigtail connector issue or a sensor that's becoming skewed or biased. So definitely want to look at that. So in this case, always don't just, you know, save your codes. That's why I love my some of my scan tools, because they actually will save the codes and I'll keep it on record. I just played around with the gel test and it did that too as well. It can store all your codes. So does my snap on all the different ones do it. So in this case, definitely it's a good idea to keep the codes. Sure, clear them out and see what comes back, right? Because I have been known that if the vehicle runs fine, but I have these related sensor codes, right? As you can see here, I will go ahead and erase the codes. I keep them in memory. And then I'll go drive the truck and I'm trying to see, okay, see if the computer catches another problem again. And don't think it magically fixes itself, guys. Well, it never came back. No, you need to make sure it doesn't happen again. So definitely want to pay attention to that. So, all right. So yeah, definitely look at codes. Uh, so if I have an intermittent, uh, let me give you an example. If I have an intermittent uh, fuel rail pressure low code, right? And that fuel pressure low code only occurs after driving it for a while. I mean, the customer takes it, comes back, and sure enough, it could be that it's happening under a load. We had one customer that drove us crazy. We beat the holy crap all out of this truck, and we nailed it. And I don't like to abuse customer's truck, but I had to. And I couldn't get even my tech Mitch took it. Finally, we had to go to, to the high grade, our Mount Charleston here in Las Vegas, and we had to really take it up the steep hill and nail it. And finally, it set that P0087. But you know where we screwed up on that truck? We did not do, or my techs, I should, I could, I should have checked that too, but we found out that we had a leaky cascade valve. So upon doing that pressure, remember I said 10 PSI, you pump up the, the, the primer pump on that Duramax, and sure enough, it dropped the pressure so quick. So we should have found it by doing that test. So we, we, we kind of messed up there. We, we did bad diagnostics, so we should have found it there. So. Well, there you go. That will affect your fuel rail pressure. But that's a good example. All right, fuel trim. Now, please note, don't look at fuel trims if you haven't checked everything else. Fuel trim is a, look at fuel trim as a fine-tune adjustment, okay? It's trying to tune those injectors to all work the same, but to also find that ideal 
you know, fuel trimming that I need to do with a cylinder. The problem in today's society, especially with the older trucks, and when I say older, I'm talking about 2012 and earlier, is the fact that there's a lot of junk injectors being sold out there. Okay, and let me tell you, that just if you don't believe me, just Google injectors for an older diesel, and you're gonna see everybody sells them for as little as 80 bucks. You know, all the way 120. Let's not tell you, you get what you pay for. And the problem is that we have installed injectors that we thought were good quality injectors, and they weren't. And in this case, we have found that the fuel trims were way off. I mean, you got a balancing rate, you got a percentage that you're looking at a power stroke, you know, and I'm, obviously I'm not giving a class on fuel trims only, but what I do want to mention is that fuel trim, for those of you that have been around gasoline, fuel trim is the same. However, though, it is very dependent on two key items is number one is compression, which can be affected by valve lash, by the way, because I fixed a lot of, like I mentioned before, fuel trim issues and balancing rates by adjusting the valves. And two is the injector performance. How well is that injector working? Because I assume you verified you have the fuel rail pressure you're supposed to have. So it is essential that engine has proper compression before analyzing fuel trim. Confer confirm cylinder power balance. Are you running on all six, eight, four, whatever, six cylinders, right? And is it, it, it is a tool to confirm the adjustment fuel, how well that cylinder is working. So I got a 6.4 outside right now, and I try to take a recording, but I ran out of time. And in this case, I got one cylinder at 12 and another one at minus nine, positive 12 minus nine. So one cylinder is adding a crapola of fuel and the other one is subtracting a whole bunch of fuel. Now, could this be because of nozzle performance on the injector? Yes. So a cleaner sometimes might come in handy. That's why we believe in doing cleaner cleaning or injector cleaning on these because that has been known to change the balancing rates or fuel trim. So therefore be aware of that because you don't know how clean that nozzle is, especially if the truck has had no love, no treatment or poor fuel filter maintenance. So for those of you that are new to this with diesel, common rail injectors are very susceptible to any trash in them and you're gonna see it a lot in fuel trim, right? Now, do not look at fuel trim if you have any code set related to fueling, right? Don't look at it because you got to go fix that, and then you can look at fuel trim. And you're going to find out that many scandals, like since I'm working on a 6.4 right now, a 6.4 will allow you to reset the fuel trims, reset them back to zero, let it start over again, right? And all of a sudden, you'll start seeing one cylinder. Whoa, that number's going up and up or going down and down, and that's telling you he's had, he needs to subtract or he needs to add a dramatic amount of fuel, which definitely tells you, A, a compression issue, or B, you have a fueling issue or nozzle issue on the injector itself. So therefore you covered your basics or did you just scan, right? As we shift along, get away from common rail now. And let me tell you, I can't tell you how many times, even when I just was a shop a few weeks ago, I was working at a shop and my God, these guys are, get on the scan tool. And I've been calling it the scan tool stupid since who knows what year. And in this case, you know, you're jumping to the basics and you forget about the basics. Like, is air filter a serious component? Yes, it is, right? And we talked about the diesel fuel as well. So not to mention from a business side, like it says at the bottom, from a business side, isn't it an opportunity to find issues to sell or make aware of, you know? You know, if I got a drivability problem, he needs a fuel filter. And then I think as, you know, thank God for today's technology of using, you know, your phones, because I can take a quick picture Send the text it to the customer. Dude, what do you want me to tell you? This is what you got. <laughs> look at your fuel filter, you know, and blah, blah, blah. So in this case, yeah, it is an idea for you to look at. And that's where a scan tool fails. That's why when I see people teaching about scanning first, no, you're looking for ushers that can achieve to that. And I have fixed numerous trucks. To the day, I still fix numerous trucks, all by inspecting the basics, right? So cover those basics, you know, so... Parts of the powertrain are important to be inspected because you're also looking for safety items, you know. We found one truck that was leaking oil, but it was also leaking a small traces of fuel. We were smelling fuel. It didn't come in for that, right? Could that have caused the fire, right? So in this case, it's a safety issue too. So when you're going underneath the chassis and you're looking at everything else, for example, we had this one truck, they just put airbags. And then we had another truck where they just put an exhaust on it, right? They put this big fat five inch exhaust in it, but he routed that line so, I mean, that tube so close to the brake line, you could see where the brake line was starting to get fried. In other words, he could have lost brakes. So in this case, don't forget about that. So when you, when somebody teaches you, you're doing a drivability, you're gonna scan, I feel like you know which finger I wanna lift up to him, you know, because it's like, really? It's like, no, I'm sorry, but you're supposed to look at that. 
And even when you look at scan tools, like, you know, when we scan a truck with a restricted interface, look what code is now available. So if you're missing it, I don't know what to tell you. Code P1548 on a power stroke 67. Yeah, there it is, 67, is telling you what? Engine air filter restricted. So if I'm scanning, let's say I'm doing a quick scan. I haven't done nothing yet, but I'm going to do it. It's five, you know, it's like quarter to five. I want to go home, but I'm going to do a quick scan on the truck so I can deal with it in the morning. Come on, there it is right there. Engine filter inspection right there. So, geez, you know. And what about, as we're figuring out a diagnostic, what about the transmission, right? What's that have to do with drivability? It has to do with everything, right? Every, that should be an exclamation mark, not a question mark. It's everything, right? Because everything you're going to feel can be actually confused from a transmission causing, right? From stalling. You can have a stalling condition. It could be that the TCC is locking up, right? It's not releasing. So you need to understand how a torque converter works. We actually lock up under highway speeds and we release at low speeds or idle speeds, right? Because if we're still locked up, that means it's like leaving the clutch out on a manual transmission. It's going to stall, right? So in this case, that can be erratic. It could be intermittently happening. That still happens to the day. That has not changed. I mean, transmissions have changed dramatically, but we could still have similar issues surging. In other words, you you're, you're, you know, when you get in a multi more than six speed transmission, you know, you're going to get that hunting effect. So it's going back and forth back. And you think of it as a surging, but it might be the transmission doing it. Not to mention the balance of it. If we have a torque converter coming apart, is that going to affect your RPM and also the rhythm that that engine is running? Yes. Yeah, so it could fool it and cause boy, fuel injection timing problems and also injection problems. So sometimes it, it, we come to the transmission to see what's going on. So that's why when you do a total scan of a vehicle, let's see if there's anything set for the transmission itself. So definitely want to pay attention to that. So yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely want to pay attention to that. So again, transmission is something we got to look. And for those of you that are dealing with fuel economies, I've had customers come in in the past, even, even lately, where, dude, I'm getting just 10 miles a gallon. I don't care, low, unloaded, I'm getting 10 miles a gallon. And I'm like, okay, it doesn't have big 40-inch tires or anything. They're not re-geared. And in this case, guess what? You know, we need to go ahead and reteach the computer where we actually will clear the transmission adapters or adapt the parameters or learns. And what we're going to do is do a co-complete relearn. So all manufacturers offer that, that you can do a relearn. Now, RAM and GM are these one. Four is the sucky one. But in this case, you definitely can reset them on, restart it all over again. Now, for those of you novices at this with transmissions, please note, you're going to do a transmission and you're going to all of a sudden find out that now you get in and the transmission shifts are lousy. Now, let her relearn. Don't panic. Just let her keep doing relearns. Do a series of shifts. Stop and go. Stop and go first, second, third, fourth. Do soft shifts and then do hard acceleration shifts and it should start learning right away. So, therefore, definitely want to pay attention to that. So, don't forget about the transmission. So that's uh, that's probably a future topic, which we'll talk about with diagnostics. So. so as I've been teaching about, you know, figuring out the problem, you saw all these possibilities and all these tests you got to do. So in this, in essence, in figuring it out is keeping all the options open of what the possibility can be. In other words, don't just say, oh, I got low rail pressure. It's an injection pump, right? Oh, I got a no-start condition. It was the batteries, and yet it was the starter, like I mentioned already, right? So in this case, we have had, like I said, issues with uh, starting out on 7.3s. And I got to tell you, as the older the 7.3s, the worse they get, because these starters are just working hard on a 7.3. And if there is a high voltage drop in the cables, we got low battery voltage, not to mention the starters coming apart internally. Yeah, you're definitely going to get hard starting 7.3s. And the guy's calling me up, and I'm listening on the phone. I go, dude, this starter is cranking awful. You got a low cranking speed there. So, And then a lot of us like to use the starting fluid as a testing. But be careful starting fluid because starting fluid has got ether in it. It only takes a little bit. When I see a guy just going bonkers on I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to destroy the motor. That is too much starting fluid destructive to an engine? The answer is yes. So if a customer has been trying to start their vehicle because they might have a high pressure leak on a Huey system and they're just starting it, and once they get it started, it works for the rest of the day fine. It's always cold start. Are you hurting the motor every day you're using that starting fluid? The answer is yes. So therefore with the battery and batteries, you know, we got to make sure those are all fully charged. And time and time and time and time and time and time again, we see batteries. So that's never an ending. Along with what Lee just mentioned in his comment, about looking at the visual inspection like we had talked about already. But then, 
you need to know what the abilities are. So if I'm working on a Ford, like I said before, yeah, I've done my basics. I've done my due diligence. I've checked the fuel. I need to make sure I got no restricted exhaust, depending on the drivability or no start problem. Now I'm at the point where I'm going to run the self-test with the scan tool, right? So you run self-test to see what the computer picks up. So if you don't understand what a self-test is, it's the computer running circuit test on all his powertrain circuits. It includes relays. It includes the circuits for the injectors. It includes the circuits for sensors and actuators along with your air conditioner. That's why you even hear the compressor click on and off when you do the self-test, key on engine off self-test. And then when you do it on key on engine run is another story. And then there's a separate one for the glow plugs and another one which we call the buzz test or click test for the injectors. So in other words, he's doing a lot of your testing there. So definitely it's nice to diagnose a Ford because I'm trying to find it. And you're going to notice that many scan tools have a little button that allows you to repeat the self-test. So guess what? You can repeat the self-test. You can repeat the self-test over and over again. And if it's a Duramax, what does GM tells us? Well, if I have a diagnostic trouble code, I'm going to find the status of that code. It's going to tell you if it's going on right now. Okay. Is that code happening again? So therefore, I can look at the status. Has it failed this ignition? Has it failed in the history? Is it requesting the check engine light? Hey, that's under DTC info. So look at your scan tools. Now, if you've never seen this on a GM, look under DTC info and click on it. And you can type in a specific DTC and it'll tell you the status of that code. So when I diagnose those, I will go ahead and look at the code. Then I'll go into specific DTC under DTC info. And I'm going to punch in that code and see what the status of it. In other words, Mr. Computer, you're testing the code. What's the status of this code? And if it's a Ram Cummins, that's the crappier one of all. It can only tell you if a code's active or inactive. That's it. So the Rams kind of suck, but you know, that's all we got. But we got that. So here's an example of DT info I've shown in the past. And I like this one because this is fuel system leak detected. You're going to notice that the last test it did, it passed. But mind you, I'm here because it said it was in memory. So in this case, this ignition, it's what? It's passed to as well. So I got definitely an intermittent problem, but it's a large leak, right? So therefore, in that high-pressure common rail system, I got a leak. And since it's been clear, it has passed and what? It has failed. So there's a lot that a GM gives you here that I continue to teach. A lot of guys don't take advantage of. So definitely look for it in your scan tool. And then you got your drivability fish bite. Right? What is the fish bite? It's an intermittent jolt that cuts out operation, but only for a brief moment where the engine does not stall. You just feel a surge. That's why we call it the fish bite, as if you were fishing, the fish is biting on your line. If you're not a fisherman, then you're missing out. But anyways, power interruption is either on a high or low side, positive or negative. Yeah, you're losing power. Something's intermittently want to cut you off. That could be the key. But then you could have a crank and cam. That's the major ones. When we actually see a fish bite effect, it could be a crank and cam issue, but it could also be a sensor issue or a sensor bias issue, such as if you're real pressure sensor. That's what recording, that's why many scantles now give you a recording ability. So you can record as you test drive and you could play it back to see who might have gone out of range when you look at the sensor signal voltage. Sensor signal voltage is what you're looking at. Or you can go live and start probing circuits. So yeah, I will actually hear, like we were talking about that fluke meter that has the removable head now. I can leave the meter down on the dash or down in the engine compartment. Yeah, I get I get careful and I'll go drive the truck and I'm watching voltages like the signal voltage on an ICP sensor, the signal voltage on a fuel rail pressure sensor and so on the map, mass airflow. Those can all cause it for me to nail who's the guy that might be it. So, and I got to tell you, I, when you're dealing with a scope like my snap on that is four channels, I can look at four sensors at the same time. Now, where am I going to tap on this? I'm going to tap in at the computer, and I'm going to tap on those sensor signals. Now, hold on. You're probably saying, whoa, I've never done that before. Well, you, hello. You go to the service menu. You get the connector in views. You look up the sensor signal for four major sensors like the crank cam, or if you want to choose the mass airflow map, engine coolant temp, and linear temp. You look at those, and you can watch them on the scope. And as you're driving, you're going to see normal wave patterns, wave pan signals. Obviously, the mass airflow and the map are going to go in up and down. But you're going to see who might be skewing out when the fish bite occurs. The frustrating part is sometimes you got to take it into default to find it. Because if I disconnect the sensor and now it doesn't do it anymore and it allows the engine to run, then that's probably my problem. But the hardest ones to diagnose is the cranking cam. And one thing I've always said when I'm scoping a cranking cam is, am I looking at the actual 
uh, fish bite that's caused by something else and there it reflects on the cam and crank or am I looking at the cam and crank doing it? If that makes sense. So, so therefore, it's a good idea to wiggle and jiggle wires and watch your scantle. So it isn't surprising I'll have the scantle sitting on top of the engine and I'm sitting there wiggling and jiggling wires, especially at the computer and that's a bit relative sensors, you know, and sometimes I nail them that way. So therefore, your job is to understand those PIDs or scan data, know what to look, right? What are you looking for? What are those signals that I'm looking for? So as you start off and you look at all the different scan data out there, right? You're going to question yourself, well, what am I looking at here? You know, where do I start? And that's something that you're going to have to figure out as you're diagnosing. In other words, I'm looking at generic. I know what's an engine date on this vehicle. So this is a 2020 Alpha IP I'm looking at right here. And you're going to see all the different datas that I have available to me. So if I do have a fish bite effect, effect I'm going to go after engine data first, right? And then you can look at other ones too, because I know the O2 sensors, AKA known as NOx sensors, that can also do it because I learned from automotive gasoline, they can be tricky too as well. But in this case, you know, you're gonna have to learn what your scan tool has available, but you gotta look at the PIDs and understand the PIDs that you are looking at. So what is it that I'm looking at? What is it that I wanna learn? So here we can see injector commands. We nailed a bad tuner this way, by the way. This truck had a tune on it. And turns out that we had a dead cylinder, couldn't figure out dead cylinder, and they already another shop had already done the injectors, right? And I'm looking, I think it was number five, don't quote me, but I believe it was number five. And we're looking at the timing command, it had zero, 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 zero. I'm trying to put a zero in my finger here. Anyway, zero. But in this case, we had zero, nothing. I'm like, I'm looking at that data, I'm, I caught it. I'm like, why is this thing at zero? I go, and we had a dead hole, we had a dead cylinder. Sure enough, it was number five, right? I think it was number five. But in this case, we're looking at the data and sure enough, you know, that was the problem. So in other words, we had a bad tune. So we we had to, and that's a big hairy thing because is that tune replaceable or not replaceable? That's the question there. So we had to figure that out. So, but anyways, what I'm trying to get at is obviously time is of essence here, but I'm trying to tell you that, you know, what is the actual data that you're looking at and what's available? So when I deal with a newer truck that I haven't played with, I'm going ahead and looking at my balance. There's my balancing rates right there. I'm looking at whatever's available through there. So since this is a 2020 truck, you know, I'm going to say, okay, I haven't done too many 2020s. I'm going to go ahead and look and see what's available for me. Not to mention now it's telling you the circuit status right there on an Alpha IP. So I've learned now what's available on an Alpha IP by playing with them and you must do the same. So definitely get acclimated with what's available. So definitely look at your you know, available PIDs to make your life easy. And like we've talked about with Alpha IPs in the past, you now have a lift pump pressure, low pressure reading. So you can read the lift pump pressure on the scan. So that's a new thing that we've had for quite a while. And again, your state of their circuits of what's going on right here. So again, you're going to notice right here, this one is showing a what for the regular low voltage circuit. Therefore, fuel pressure regulator one, which is the uh, volume control valve. What did he catch right there? A what? A malfunction. So you're getting more and more better on those uh, pit tit lists. So therefore, definitely do your homework and try to figure out stuff. Not to mention, as I'm going to show you right here, I believe on this recording I have it, where you can actually put graph lines. So as I can test drive, again, I can look at my desired fuel rail pressure. Again, my fuel rail pressure itself, my actual, compare one with the other. And as I snap the throttle, look what happened right there. Look at the one up on the left, upper right. You're going to see, I don't know how fast it's moving on your computer screens, but you're going to notice they're just about the same, aren't they? So therefore, that's what you're looking at. Now, the one thing I'm going to pull up later on is I'm looking at the sensor signal voltage. Make sure I'm not in a default condition. So definitely something to look at. So what about a sensor that is in default, right? So what about a sensor that is in default or a lip motor inhibit function, right? So we learned this long ago from other engines, but, you know, for example, when I was dealing with gasoline engines back in the day, the old 5.7 GM gas motors, it, some of them had a mass airflow, had a MAP sensor. We used to call it mass airflow versus speed density. And what we used to do is we used to disconnect the mass airflow sensor and the yeah, mass airflow let it run on speed density, which was the MAP sensor. And that was kind of like a default valve, the default thing that it did. So if the drivability problem went away, we definitely knew it was mass airflow. So there is what we call a default value. Um, the worst ones are the Ram Cummins because they won't tell you sometimes. 
and uh, and Ford products, we've seen it too as well, where you'll lose the fuel rail pressure sensor or the ICP sensor, and all of a sudden you have a valley right there. But the way you'll know you're in a default function is one of two ways. Either one is the desired and actual rail pressure are exactly the same. I mean, exactly the same. You know, it, it one should follow the other. As it desires, the actual will follow, you know. So therefore, they're not always exactly one follows the other. So if I'm desiring 11,000, I come to 22,000, it's going to follow it up to 22, but they're not exactly the same. If they're exactly the same, then you definitely know you're probably in a default value. So in this case, you want to look at the sensor signal voltage. That's the second way. So if I'm looking at the fuel rail pressure sensor, if I'm looking at the ICP sensor, I'm going to look at the actual signal voltage there as you're trying to figure out, am I in a default value? Right. So therefore, the question begs, before I even continue, the question begs this. Is a default value or a limp mode home function designed to keep the engine running? The answer is yes and no. So the answer is yes or no. There are default values that are designed to keep the truck from starting, and there are default values to keep the engine running, believe it or not. If it's trying to keep the engine from running, that means it's protecting itself. Okay, that can happen. So if you ever dealt with a wrench light on a Ford product, the wrench light is telling you he's in inhibit mode. He's he's derating you to third gear or no start or idle only because there's a problem with the pedal. There's a problem with transmission fluid temperature and so on. So in this case, you have to understand that all not all default values are there to keep the engine running. They keep could keep the engine from running too as well. So like I said already, look at the signal voltage of that perspective sensors, right? Look at your sensor, see what's going on. You should have a diagnostic trouble code set. So if you have a diagnostic trouble code set for a fuel rail pressure sensor, then you're going to go after that sensor signal, but not all the time, depending if the problem was there long enough. Sometimes you're going to cycle the key off and fire it up and everything's back to normal. So that's telling you, you lost signal for some odd reason. So you got to figure out that's where your intermittent wiggle test and start figuring out where the problem is at there. So. So always confirm sensor signal by observing voltage signal for a perspective sensor. Always do that. So when you are looking at it, you're going to look at all that. So. so as I finish up, remember, I didn't have time to get into after treatment, and we have had presentations done on after treatment, that, you know, you got to understand that in today's trucks, when we're trying to get them out of derate, right, you got to make sure everything in after treatment is okay. There should be no code set. So if you have yourself a situation like I've discussed before, where you have a D-rate condition but no check engine light, right? You can have a D-rate with no check engine light or a threat to D-rate, like in 30 miles it's going to D-rate to, you know, to idle speed, right? That means he hasn't been able to verify knock. So this is where you need to understand that, okay, one thing is to have a drivability problem, an intermittent problem, a stalling problem. Another thing is to have an emission control problem. OK, so if you have an emission control problem, that means the conditions were not right for it to test itself, because when it comes to the after treatment, it comes down to two things. And that is NOx reduction and particulate matter being collected and trapped. So in this case, we've got to check it out, meaning that the computer is doing a pretty good job of telling you where he's having an issue with. OK, so let's say let me let me challenge you here. Let's say you have a truck come in. And I tell you, hey, I want you to tell me that DPF is loaded. How do you know a DPF is loaded? All right? What are you going to look at, right? You can do the Tony on cork method, and if it runs better, yeah, it's loaded. For the, yeah, it could be a DPF, but it could be an SCR catalyst or some other catalyst, right? And if you have a particulate matter sensor code set on a power stroke 6.7, what should that particulate matter read on your scan tool? Well, it usually is biased. Most 99% of all that I have fixed, it's biased. I started up cold. I start it up hot, it's the same reading of particular matter. I go, whoa, we're definitely biased. It's not changing. So that's how I was able to diagnose that. I mean, obviously, the module has power and ground, and then it's on CAN network. So I got to figure out what's going on with the CAN network there. But in this case, there's no U code. So definitely, I am communicating. I'm reading that on the scan tool. So therefore, there's no CAN issues. But I am going to verify power and ground going to it. Do not replace a NOx sensor. Do not replace a particulate matter sensor if you haven't verified power and ground going to that module. Always test it, right? In other words, a voltage drop test on the connector going to it. So, But anyways, what I'm trying to get at is you've got to understand that these after-treatment systems, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, requires you to have an engine running at optimum levels. 
the quality of that exhaust must be there. Now, again, you're going to have to figure out what are the issues that go wrong with SCR, which I've already presented on in previous presentations, but you got to understand what it's looking for. In other words, we talked about, let's see, does anybody remember what I said is a high amount of NOx on the inlet of the whole after treatment? And what should we see afterwards? What's the percentage afterwards? You know, Do you know that? If you don't, then you got to know that. Do you understand that when deaf fluid is injected, it actually converts to ammonia? It is the ammonia that breaks up the NOx. But then an injector that's spraying or reductant injector that's injecting that deaf fluid, right? It's got to have a certain spray pattern and it's got to have so many streams and so much volume. You can have the volume, but you also need to have a fine mist, fine mist spray. So all that is involved with that. So obviously, if you don't have, go back to the Lucas uh, YouTube channel or my channels, whatever, and you're going to see that I do cover that in previous presentations. And by the way, thank you, Lucas, for continuing to sponsor. There you go. So therefore, do that. So in, in turn, as I'm starting to finish up here and my time is running short, please note, know your scantle. I just taken on the gel test a bit ago. We finally got it up and running on my laptop and playing around with it. Know how to set up. You know, there are groups. This, this allows me to set up groups. So in this case, the one that I set right there for the screen capture that I just did was I was uh, going to look at field trims, right? So I'll, if I can set up a separate data list for field trims, hey, that's really nice. But I'm going to make sure I got my field real pressures and I've checked everything else, right? So get playing with your scan tools, but understand what your scan tool is serving you and what it's reading to you. So I guess what I'm trying to say, as much as I tell people to get really versed on their service manual, you also need to get well versed with what your scan tool is offering you, what it gives you. Because I would say technicians probably use no more than 40% of the capabilities of a scan tool because they won't research more. So I would hope security gets the, I mean, a curiosity gets the best of you and try to find out what's available on your scan tool. Like here, I can turn on and off the transfer pump. I can control the high pressure volume control valve and the pressure control valve and play with the VGT and play with the fan and the EGR and the intake throw up. I mean, I know what I have it. So I know in my head what I can test on each perspective platform as I have played with them through the years. So should you. So definitely want to look at that. Now, once again, you're going to find out that most scan tools now allow you to do a code scan. I mean, look at all the modules on this 2014 round 2500 here. I mean, look at all this, right? But if I'm doing a code scan, I'm going to code scan everything to see what's going on. Because like I've said before, you know what? Somebody said it the other day real, around here real easily. He says, it's amazing how a low battery can cause code set everywhere. Well, of course, everybody's going to say they have low voltage. So you can have a gazillion code set there telling you that you got low voltage there. So in this case, you know, you have to be careful about that. So most definitely got to keep that in mind. You know, it's like know what's available for you. And understand that you can have codes everywhere and you need that could you know affect your drivability issues so you got to put it all together so what is the title of this is to let's diagnose and let's figure it out in figuring it out you got to do extensive testing to know what's going on and if you're like me where i get a truck that comes from a shop that couldn't fix it i gotta first fix what they screwed up and my god when i see wires cut and pigtails or things bypassed it's like, oh, my God, really? Why did they do this thinking they could just make it run and live with the check engine light on, right? Those are the nightmare ones. So, yeah. So in this case, again, what we're trying to say is, you know, know what you're looking at. Understand the subsystem. And, guys, I just hit the tip of the iceberg. So there's a lot more to cover, a lot more to understand. But hopefully I hit hard on the big ones that I see a lot where guys are just not fluent into it. So, And I apologize to those that are fluent on it. But at the same time, I hope you learned something in there. And you can let me know in the chat comments. So what do you think, Mr. David? I think that um, somebody just sent me a, a text message saying all this information is just priceless. And he's, he's very, very true. You know, very, very good statement there. It's so, um, I guess it's all the little bits and pieces, all these little, you know, bits of information that are, are priceless because... It's not the sort of thing you learn in a textbook or on videos or anything like this. It's a um, it's, it's tremendous. And we really appreciate all this information that you share with us so that we can all be better technicians in the end, you know, and uh, work more efficiently. Um, it's great. Uh, we have a, a, a few things here in the um, 
the chat as well as the q and a i don't know can you see your your end uh yeah the chat well that's carl hello carl and matthew is saying what are you thinking we should do with most recent ram comments reflash oh the ones from the recall you i guess you're talking about i'm telling guys don't do it <laughs> and if you're doing it um i hear that the fuel economy is is getting worse so that's the latest I've heard. So, yeah, I've had a few phone calls where people are telling me, Matt, that they're asking if they can go back on their flash file or they're not looking at a tune. So uh, that's a legal thing. But in this case, you got to be careful. Uh, Matthew also had, we had a customer who recently had dealer to do laser, now five miles per gallon loss. Yes, and increased death fluid. Yes. So therefore, my question, should they avoid the flashes? The answer is yes. So, yeah, I would say to ask. So, I don't know if the government's mandate them that they have to have the flash. As far as I know, no at this time. But, no, don't do the flash anyway. So, there you go. So, some of you may have had that happen. So, therefore. And uh, Carl Snyder says, hello, Jose. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Carl. Thank you for being here. Very good. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's all I see there, sir. Do you see any other questions and comments? No, I don't see any others. So that's uh, basically it. So we really appreciate uh, all that good information. Just like to remind everybody that uh, we'll be sending you some information so that you can get a certificate for this um, this presentation for participating. And that uh, this uh, video will also be, as Tony just said a few moments ago, uh, will be on the, uh, the Lucas Diesel Systems uh, YouTube channel. So you can share that. Uh, with others uh, within your company. Um, and you can refer to it as well, meaning to say that sometimes one tends to not be able to grasp everything and make notes real quickly so that uh, that, that information is available to you for you know a considerable amount, quite a few months you know, before we start deleting some of those videos. So other than that, uh, we'll be having another um, webinar in April. Stay tuned, uh, look out for your emails and uh, we'll be telling you what uh, date uh, we'll be having this next webinar in April. So on that, thank you very much, Tony. And we look forward to uh, another webinar in April. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day.